I'm Jeff. Um, that's me if you want to scan me. I'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm Jeff Rupert. I work for a company called 3D Systems. Um, technical business development is my role now, but it's kind of applications, um, segment strategies type of thing. Um, I graduated from here with uh, nothing that had to do anything with 3D printing at the time, um, but MCDB and then economics back in the day. What is MCDB? Molecular Cellular Developmental Biology. Yeah, kind of so, but I graduated in 08, essentially, which was a rock in time to, to graduate. Um, I had an internship at a local pharmaceutical company doing something. Um, they kind of kept me on, but then they were going to get um, acquired and I was going to have to move to Chicago or New York and I didn't want to do that. Um, so I ended up finding this job at a company called Medical Modeling, um, which as a quality engineer, which is what I was doing as an uh, intern at the time. So it was kind of, uh, it worked out well. And I, they were going to pay me money to work, which at the time was a rare thing to be able to find as a new grad. So we took we took them up on their offer. Um, so Medical Modeling was a company, it started in the late 90s um, by a guy named Andy Christensen. It was kind of in this nondescript office park in Golden. Um, and the core competency at the time, um, Andy's dad was one of the first guys to do um, TMJ surgery, so the disjoint, basically. Um, he, and he spun out this modeling business um, to son Andy at the time. Um, so the core competency of medical modeling was taking DICOM images, so CT, MR data, um, moving it through digital workflow, and then creating anatomical models from that. Um, Sort of at the time that I started, um, we were also starting to do metal printing. Um, so we were really early um, adopters of RCAMS technology, so electron beam um, metal technology. So there was Ola at NC State had one. There was a company in Ventura, California called CalRAM that had two um, for aerospace applications. And then we had two for orthopedic applications. Um, so in that 2000. 10 area two like big things happened so we started doing so anatomical models was used primarily to take really complex surgeries and like give the surgeon a tangible something so he could talk about it with the surgeon or with the um the team that was doing it with the patient with the patient's family because a lot of times these were like complex pediatric cases as well um now as the software and the workflow became better that naturally sort of progressed into surgical planning so taking that 3d model which at, the, at that time is just the 3d model but then manipulating it in digital space to do surgical planning um so that was a big part of our business back, back then we brought the first planning uh medical device to market and that's actually it's kind of interesting because that's a uh, um it's not the piece at the end so it's not like the eyeglasses that you print that's the device it's the entire workflow so like all the software that's used as part of it um, as a workflow so that's become ubiquitous in certain applications and so like uh creating a maxillofacial um like 95 percent of those surgeries are pre-planned um and there's a lot of college age kids um so it's there's some like by alignment you have to be mature enough that your skeleton's not moving around a lot but um early enough that you can you know handle it um that's then moved into, you know, all sorts of other things like knees, hips, shoulders, um, and otherwise. Um, right now, it's mostly to fit off the shelf implants. Um, but anyways, and then we brought the first implant to market as well that was additively manufactured back in 2010. Um, I came on at a good time, helped kind of pull it over the finish line, but I'm taking a little bit of credit for it. Um, that company was acquired by 3D Systems in 2014, along with a few others. So, um, and then we moved down the road. So we're not in Golden anymore. We're in Littleton. We're kind of at 470 in Bulls. Um, we have 200,000 square feet, like 250 people. So probably the largest install base of metal printers in America. Um, there's a bigger one in Ireland, but um, quietly just off the highway, you could throw a rock from the highway to the office. Um, one of the biggest 3D printing um, facilities in the world and definitely in America. Um, so that's like where 3D Systems comes in. Um, 3D Systems was um, the first additive manufacturing. We didn't call it that. It was rapid prototyping back then. Um, but it was the first company 
Um, it was launched in 86. So actually Chuck Hall, another CU grad, um, he's from the Western Slope of Colorado, um, but he graduated in the and I think early 60s um, with engineering physics major. Um, grew up on the Western Slope, but another, you know, home team guy. Um, he's still hanging out, uh, doing a lot of stuff in regenerative medicine. But he invented sterilithography in 1983. He applied for the patent, which is kind of crazy to think about. Most people don't think that it's a 40-year-old technology. Um, he was working at a photopolymer company. Um, so chemistry, everything from like, very complex, you know, um, very, very, very high end materials that go on like leading edge of airplane wings that you think you're on there, um, like ablative type of stuff, um, or simple things like the embossment on a business card, like that's a photopolymer as well. Um, and he came up with this idea of like, okay, if I stack photopolymers, if I silk screen photopolymers on each other, essentially, then I can come up with, yeah, I can make a three dimensional object. Um, so he patented that in 1983, um, and in 1987 came out with the SLA one, um, which was the first. I think the ASTM term for it now would be bat polymerization, but stereolithography, so laser over bat um, of a photoresin or a photopolymer. Um, SLAs continue to be a huge part of our um, overall business. I think. From here, I'll kind of just go through some applications that are cool. Just a lot of pictures of cool stuff. Um, since then, 3D Systems has grown by a lot of acquisitions. Um, so really the only, like, say, core um, technology that 3D Systems invented is still VAT polymerization. So it's um, now there you have DLP over VAT or under VAT, depending on what that looks like. So, you know, the rather than have I mean, rastered lines that you're printing, um, printing whole pictures at a time, images at a time. So that's what most of the newer um, inexpensive stuff can be. So that's, you know, um, some people would recognize it, but like the old projections, to the old big screen TVs where you had the Texas Instruments projector in the back, that same projector is used now pretty ubiquitously for a lot of the DLP stuff. I think we call it DPP, direct projection printing because DLP is patented by Texas Instruments. Um, but that's that's a big part of it. We acquired a company out of University of Texas called DTM, um, which is now SLS. Um, we acquired a couple metals businesses. So ours, medical modeling, and then there's a company in uh, Belgium called Layerwise. We acquired Xerox's jetting technology, which now makes up our multi-jet technology. And then most recently, um, the extrusion stuff um, through two acquisitions called uh, Titan Robotics, which is a Colorado company um, down in Colorado Springs. Um, they, they make a super cool um, pellet extrusion printer that's just massive. Um, and then uh, the company out of Munich called Comovis, which makes a very small med device specific extrusion printer for mostly like polyurethane heat zone, uh, peak pec type of stuff. So, um, yeah, so what we're, you know, I think it's important, like what everybody open invite, we're down, it's, it was 47 minutes today, I think it's usually like 45, but it was a little wet, um, but we're just off of uh, 470 in Bowles, um, like I said, massive facility, um, but we have um, facilities elsewhere as Where's well. Where's the facility but in Belgium? Leuven? Leuven, yeah. Yeah, okay. so kind of like, there's that, that Leuven's also kind of a center of additive stuff. John Pierre Cruz um, sort of forbearing work. So like, it's not enough to like, you'd have to have a really good arm to throw a stone to materialize, but in the same like office park essentially is materialized. And then there's a load of other stuff kind so of materialized is, the, is what you bought. Basically. We didn't buy materialized. No, we're still frenemies, if you will. So, you know, they, they buy a lot of stuff from us. We buy a lot of stuff from them. Um, not the same company, but um, so like, yeah, materialized magics, mimics, you know, we have some of those, some of those are part of the workflow. So like early on when we made that initial workflow is all mimics, magics. Now there's some level of, we have some competing products, but they spend, we spend seven figures with each other annually, pretty regularly. So it's a small little world that we live in. I think we're net positive on hiring, um, Materialized employees. I lived in Belgium for a few years, and 
think I hired four materialized people and they didn't hire any of ours. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it ups and flows. So um, so DFAM, design for additive. I mean, I think that's key to a lot of what you guys are doing here. But one of the things, you know, the correlation between cost and complexity as well, it's always been the, the additive philosophy, right? Is that we caught it, you know, the design complexity is free is what we always say. It's not totally free, but there's, you know, different constraints to it. Um, where you can get super, super complex without having any, you know, correlation to cost. It doesn't necessarily get exponentially more expensive. Um, there's other things to take in mind. I think I, I personally, I think DFAM is interesting to say DFAM, but ultimately it's just DFF, right? As, especially as you look towards like a production world, um, you still just need a design for manufacturability, for inspectability, but the constraints are different. Your design space can open up massively with design for additive. Um, so what does that look like? You know, it's, it's usually sort of this dance of design materials and process um, along with the sort of um, embedded science physics and, and stuff that's going on um, to, to bring it all together. Um, but really at the center there is where it all meets. You know, if we think about like metal printing, laser bed powder fusion, um, you can design something, but it's not what you're going to print, especially as you think of like a lattice or something like that, right? You can model what you want your lattice to be, but the physics of the size of your weld pool is actually going to play a profound effect on what you actually get. Um, so that's where kind of your design, your materials, because you also, you know, when you think about process, as you get into really, really complex end use production parts, it rarely ends at printing, right? It's the, there's always something else that's going to go, even like the eyeglasses you just showed, right? You have to assemble them, you have to do some of those port removal, things like that. Computation up there twice for a reason because of that. <laughs> <laughs> I might have. Uh, <laughs> I might have word arted myself into a little bit of a mess here because we have physics twice and computation yeah. twice. I think that is, uh, yeah. yeah, they are good. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Quick question. Well, yeah. Uh, you mentioned weld pool, and I'm not very uh, familiar with the metal yeah. uh, additive space. Uh, you know, I've watched a lot of videos of it in dreams, uh, but I'm not familiar with that term. So, laser powder bed fusion is. Powder bed, you just put powder bed down, um, recap, but it's essentially just a welding process. Okay. So you use a laser weld. Um, so you weld 2D images essentially over and over and over to create a three-dimensional object. Cool. Um, but the, the, you know, we we joke that like plastics is easy. So like a lot more of our time is actually focused from an application standpoint on metal stuff because it's so hard mm -hmm. um, because you have the the process is difficult in and of itself, right? You're creating smoke and condensate, but you're also, um, the the thermal history of a part is very important. So like something like titanium, right? A, a beta titanium, just to say something is like super, super, you create an immense amount of thermal stress that turns into residual stress. So then you have to integrate that into your design. How's it gonna move? How am I gonna relieve that stress? Do I build a, a, a model that, you know, essentially like digital windage. Do I build a compensated model that's going to account for that distortion? Yes, it's the answer most of the time. But then you get into the fun business of, okay, if that's going to go on a rocket or into a body, then I built something that isn't what you wanted, but it is what you wanted at the end. So that, like, that link up of what your digital design is to what your 2D drawing or what your, your design spec says is always a, a fun dance to, to play. Is there any linked processes? I know these guys at Minds that have this you know, they printed wax and then they lost wax cast. Yeah. Are there any automated systems like that? Of course, I have a whole section okay. on casting because yeah. casting has been one of these. It's so, um, yeah, I'll get to it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mines is doing a lot now. They have, one of, they have a few metal printers. There's uh, the adapt consortium. They're, they're doing cool stuff. But, um, so, like, what our group does is that application development, which is essentially taking requirements with tool capacity and then design engineering and process optimization to find the right tool selection. I was kind of just describe it as a, you know, they have a broad tool set, but aren't a hammer looking for nails. Um, and then one of our, our saying, you know, just because we don't have a solution, a lot of times we still kind of create one and essentially application engineering is 
solution integration for lack of a better term. So some examples of what's kind of happening in laser powder bed fusion. Some of these are like super ubiquitous. So rockets and orthopedic implants are everybody prints them. Um, first though, everybody prints bottle openers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're starting to see the bottle opener trend relax a little bit. Now we're moving into the pen trend. But, um, you know, what we, I always like to start with the bottle opener because it, it still is a, it's a functional design. Everybody's got one. But, um, you know, what you're able to do through like kind of topology optimization and otherwise build, you know, tubular optimized structures. Oh, we can do better. <laughs> <laughs> this is fused. It's got plastic and metal. There you go. <laughs> kind of like as printed over mold. I like it. Um, you can, so what we will show is like you can have an HNL one that weighs less than a titanium one because you can hollow it out and actually get better structural optimization with it. Um, this is another one. So, satellite structures, there's probably, I think, over 2,500 of these things in space right now. Um, so, anytime you get, um, sorry, let me just silence my phone. I did that earlier. Um, so like the Wi-Fi you get on an airplane is beamed down from a satellite with one of these. And the complexity of it is, you know, where they go in orbit, whether it's like low Earth orbit or like proper orbit, the antenna needs to point to a different place to cover it. So there's it's it's a perfect application for we'll call it mass customization. They all kind of look the same. But where the antenna, you know, the, the round portion where the actual antenna is going to beam off of is always unique. Mm -hmm. um, they need to be strong for like 10 minutes. And after that, you're, you're basically, they need to be really, really light um, and, and really precision machine. Um, so this is something that you see tons of, four of them. It's a company called Talis Linea um, that you just have loads and loads of these things on. Um, they're really easy to print. They're really, really difficult to machine. Um, so that's where the design for manufacturing comes into play. Um, this is another example of kind of RF chassis. So like RF design, um, the black art that is RF um, design and integration um, integrated into um, a chassis as well. So just another example of the same kind of thing. Um, these are what the antennas look like. Um, so waveguides and then multimodal antennas. Um, what you see on that bottom right, that's actually an SEM picture. Um, and you have a 20 micron fin. Um, so super, super high level of detail. Um, and you think about how you conventionally manufacture this kind of thing. It's a lot of processing. Um, and you are constrained in a lot of times by the actual, the manufacturing and what you're able to do from a design standpoint there. Um, so this is another place where <clears throat> like RF is becoming an AM first, especially for a certain segment of, um, of the different kinds of antenna and uh, waveguides. Um, so this is actually, this is an example. The top part is, is lost wax cast. Um, so probably more printers in the world are sold to print wax than anything else. Um, for castings, um, everything from jewelry to like GE's doing it for single crystal turbine engine or turbine blades. They're printing in wax and then, you know, putting tungsten in it to basically create all the channels. Um, but you can also print it directly and actually take a bunch of the weight out. So that's kind of the, the two mode on this. Um, the casting's definitely been one of the just, it's everywhere all the time. Um, tooling has been another one. So this is a die cast tool. Um, Tooling is expensive, um, and the you start thinking about like throughput and what you can get from an efficiency standpoint with proper cool with like really designed cooling integration or heating integration, but the thermal management of it um, and additive really allows you to do that without having to go to like a vacuum based kind of process. Um, flexures, um, there's a lot of talk about um, onshoring semiconductor manufacturing. Um, the semiconductor guys think that additive is, you know, we're, we're cavemen with blunt instruments, um, trying to make fires with, you know, rubbing sticks together. They speak in language, they speak in units that we don't quite get to yet. We're in, we're in microns and think that's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> they're in nanometers and that's a whole different ballgame, but 
being able to print integrated flexures for some of these optical components is super interesting because you can build them monolithically. Um, they're typically almost good consumables. Um, so if you can build it monolithically, put a bunch of pieces together, um, that's becoming pretty ubiquitous as well. Um, manifolds, so reduction of vibration and turbulence and then thermal management. Um, we have a really cool, the, the CERN piece, um, we have some information about that on our website, but that was a, a really cool application. It was a really challenging one because it's super, super thin and really tall in titanium, which is very difficult to do because it wants to move. Um, but manifolds have become ubiquitous as well, just from a, you can put so many pieces into one. And a lot of these processes are kind of low yield, long lead time types of things. Whereas if you can print it and kind of do that one, one, one go, you can save a lot of time and money. Um, heat exchangers. Um, so we see all sorts of uh, copper, aluminum. I think the material component of heat exchangers has been the biggest issue thus far um because you can basically a lot of the materials like aluminum for instance you can't print like pure aluminum without putting some sort of inoculant in it with, with laser powder bed so you can't get the proper uh the the right level of conductivity copper is also difficult to print on just your normal like 1070 infrared laser so there's ways to do it but you we've lost so we've lost a lot of scan heads and mirrors um, to the, the copper gods in their day. Um, this is an, actually an example of a optimized through um, computational fluid dynamics um, cold plate um, for this is used to build. So most of the microchips in our phones, computers everywhere are they start with a 300 millimeter diameter single crystal silicon disk, basically that you chop up and then you, you conduct, you create transistors and whatnot within that chip and, and little pieces. The actual manufacture of cold plates is, is super important because it, it improves the yield, improves the overall lead time for it. You know, there's $13 billion of these produced a year just on the plate side, much, much less the actual pieces that are produced with it. So if you're able to optimize for building it monolith thickly and then optimize even for like kelvins or millikelvins um, of homogeneity of thermal issues over the plate that can be super super powerful so we don't have any in production yet we have we've printed a bunch of these frisbees but um they will eventually go into machines like very very expensive machines that produces um um silicon wafers uh, and that's a huge huge burgeoning market so um sorry that's the plate that you're putting the wafers on as you're building the- Yeah, the as you actually deposit the silicon that is basically used, it creates a single crystal mm -hmm. silicon chunk that then you cut up and slice and dice into actual, like yeah. some like in, into actual chips. Okay. Yeah. Um, rockets is really the next place that like, I think I don't know if anybody saw it on the news last week, the relativity space has a, fully printed, like 95% printed rocket that they got most of the way to space. They, their first try was pretty good. Um, SpaceX has, you know, just on like the Raptor engine has 72 printed components. Actually, the vast majority of those are cast, um, but print indirect, um, indirect printed. Um, but like manifolds on the fuel and um, oxidizer side, um, the actual thrust chambers themselves like basically all 20,000 pound and less chambers are printed now um, for any regeneratively cooled um, engine and the reason that is is because you can build these in really intricate internal channels and you'll have you know 5,000 6,000 C plasma with maybe a millimeter or two copper alloy between that and like negative 200 degree liquid methane um, or another oxidizer or fuel. Um, essentially, you know, this is how we're we're doing that. Uh, most of the new engines are liquid methane, but very, very hot versus very, very like if you were to touch the outside of it, it would be ice cold. It would hurt you because it would be it would be like touching drives. Um, so they used to do this with like niobium alloys and basically extruded 
uh, tubes and then brazing them together in like the RS-22 or 25 engine that was on like the shuttle, that thing would take like, like four years to make and be just excessively expensive. Um, so as we want to, you know, a lot of the new engines, smaller engines, more of them, um, but in classes that you can print um, in order to do this kind of thing. Um, it's also a state of the art that our all injectors are printed at this point too. Um, you see kind of fuel injectors and in IGT, like industrial gas turbine as well as space. And then um, you see it on the other side of that wafer table as well. So the shower head that's it's in a very caustic environment that's depositing. Um, all that sort of fluid management, you can do really cool stuff. So what we've done on this one is actually like rifled it and then having different angles on it. So you get better aspiration um, and you get better, um, you can optimize your stoichiometry better about your fuel to oxidizer ratio um, and then really tune that nicely to this. You see so many prints with these uh, very narrow channels with apparently like you can't stick your finger in there to get the excess material out. How, how do you clean out of the excess dust that you don't um, incorporate into the print? So you do the easy way like this for the show part, and you just only do halves. Yeah. And then it doesn't matter. Um, but <laughs> no, usually it, it, uh, there's there's a few ways that we do it. So depending on the level of cleanliness that's required. So like for this and the semiconductor stuff, you have to be super, super clean. Um, you don't want a little extra extra in there because that would yeah. it screws things up um so that you use high and low frequency vibrations and air basically to get it out um but we'll typically also run um, some sort of chemical etch process afterwards as mm -hmm. well because you get these like van der waals adhered particulates that kind of stick to the walls of these things and you can look at them under a microscope and move them around but they don't come off without some level of either mechanical or chemical energy mm -hmm. um you can't wail on this thing enough to get all of it out. Yeah. Um, so then you start thinking about moving some chemical through it um, to, to reduce that. Um, we've shown cleanliness on like a manifold, like a yay big manifold, um, down to like four particles total. Um, okay. So very effective. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, the semiconductor guys really, really care about that. Uh, <laughs> And it's a small manifold that's going on a hundred and sixty dollar, hundred and sixty million dollar piece of equipment that is cooling, you know, it's, <laughs> so that it matters. Um, the other one that we do a lot of in in Littleton is just AM applications for medical device, um, and there's so many of them. We talked a little bit about the history of AM or history of medical modeling, which is really this uh, surgical planning stuff, um, but. Also state of the art, like all these spine cages, the sort of middle guys, um, those are used to fuse um, the, basically pull out your spine, your, your disc, and then put this in to fuse it for degenerative uh, disc disease. Um, almost all of those are printed now. Um, they're not custom, but they're not not custom. So a lot of like 2000 part sizes with it because you can. Um, and then, Orthopedic is also, so any place where you're replacing bone um, with another sort of osseoconductive material like titanium, um, there's been a big push for additive, mostly for actually from the supply chain standpoint, because you don't have to do like a porous plasma centered bead um, kind of process afterwards, which are long lead time, low yield kind of processes. Um, and you can really tune what your lattice looks like that then will help um, osteocytes conduct towards them. Um, so how does process play into all of this? So, you know, opening up the design space by um, removing the need for supports in some places. Um, so especially on some of these like energy types of applications, all the turbo machinery looks kind of the same depending on what it is, whether it's a terrestrial like IGT type of thing or a rocket. Um, and there's a lot of overhangs on those that are difficult to manage. Um, so actually working on the process to um, basically create a heat sink underneath um, so that, especially in metal printing, the need for supports isn't to hold the part up, it's actually to hold it down um, and manage the heat. So, you know, using um, really cool computational things that you can kind of understand what this looks like and then basically come do a single pass on the laser um, where you're not melting, but you're creating kind of a heat sink. You can kind of create that dross that you can see underneath. 
um, losing in cup, uh, hip cups as well. So we've, you know, from, you know, 2010, when we first started doing it to now, we were able to show like a 70% decrease in overall cost um, because actually the post-processing on this stuff is so expensive. If you don't have to do a ton on the finishing of the rim, um, it, it really helps to improve stuff there. Um, also, like, when you, you, know, you can do higher productivity things like building it rather than only at like 30 microns, you can build it 90 micron layers of really piece of film there. Um, see some of the parts and this is what it looks like. Unblast it, you blast it and it looks beautiful. Um, spine cages, we've talked, you know, those are ubiquitous. Everybody does a spine cage. Always the tricky part here is like, do you machine it or do you just do some like manual process to clean up your supported area? Um, so we said, we don't want to do either of those things. Um, so we kind of created this nesting approach where you can kind of create a contact with support and just pull it off the printer, heat treat it, put it in a batch process, like a tumble blasting process. Um, and then it's, you know, four to six RA off. And that's plenty good for the application. Um, so it reduces the overall, it, it improves your yield immensely because it takes manual process out, um, but also improves the, the overall cost overall. Um, this is another one that doesn't get a lot of credit, but, um, digital silicon tooling. Um, so a lot of the, um, the, nobody's really figured out how to print silicon, um, directly. Well, people do it, but not, I wouldn't say well. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we've actually done from a functional prototyping standpoint is create shell tooling around it. So a really thin wall, um, an SLA, which you just inject silicon into. Um, and you can iterate on this stuff really quick. So this is one of the parts that we'll have it like a trade show pretty regularly, has a lot of our different materials on it. Um, but all the Silicon Valley guys, um, they have a lot of printers doing mostly this kind of thing. So actually rapid prototyping, but on a pretty industrial scale. Um, and you can see the egg tail on the top and then the, the actual tooling, you kind of have the ports. Um, but then the actual um, silicon itself is, it's, you wouldn't know that it was not um, just normally cast. This company in Southern California doing this kind of thing, um, just kind of um, aids for um, living. And then we, we, talk, we started talking about this and then there was a company got a hold of us that does these like custom pewter chess pieces and mm -hmm. You know, you can do the same thing um, with some of the low temp um, metals like this. Yeah, actually, you could, we were casting metal or well, casting pewter with um, uh, just a polymer. Yeah, the mines guys have a Kickstarter where they're doing the D and D dice and all kinds of yeah. fancy things. Yeah. Yeah. In gold, in, in, you know, platinum. Whatever you want, you can. People always ask if you can print that. I mean, you certainly can. It's just like who's going to buy that much powdered gold? Yeah, um, it becomes. We're doing niobium right now, which is like three thousand a kilo. Um, niobium, hafnium, and that application space is really, really small um, when you get into high value stuff like that. But yeah, if you can do it indirectly, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so this is the large format pellet extrusion. So really big versions of what you guess what I saw downstairs from an extrusion standpoint, but instead of using filament, you're using pellet. Um, you can use filament, but you can just go direct pellet. So similar to like how you injection mold, um, make it amorphous, shoot it. Um, so they see a lot, we're doing a lot here in like vacuum forming because you can actually like through the process, make it porous um, and then create tooling in a matter of hours instead of days, months, weeks, um, type of thing. Um, just to give you an idea of scale, that would have been like an eight hour print. So not even that long. Well, this is the part that at trade shows will actually just print this. Um, it's just, it cranks. You start, you look at it, you know, filament stuff, you know, it's the size of the nozzle and it's like a 10 millimeter. It's just, a, it's crazy. Um, We've been doing a lot of um, ducting here as well. This is one of the places where polymer has early, early on taken off. So like yeah, actually in the late 90s, Boeing qualified um, nylon 11 for flight use on some of their fence stuff. Um, so you get basically ESD flame retardant um, type of ducting and you're able to do this without um, 
you can do more organic shapes. So what you're able to do there is get into more of like a conformal area. So if you're if we're short on real estate, you can get in there. Um, you can probably tell what that is, but it's actually used for sand casting. So like all the like the I don't remember the brand, but um, and it's it's wiped out on here. But basically, making a sand casting tool for cast iron skillet. Um, <laughs> typically, you do that with sand casting, but it's it, the tooling for that's relatively expensive. This you can do it for thirty bucks of material in a couple hours. Like wow. just your normal type of sand casting tooling. Um, another one that is kind of crazy that is it's really cool is and we actually we started showing up like design shows like some of the Milan stuff but actually printed furniture um and that's where we've seen some of the the bigger customers for this product is actually in furniture um so light fixtures furniture um which is crazy design space that you, you can have um and then you can do it at at scale because it's like so when you go with your orthotics, you walk in. Oh no, you're gonna sit in the seat now. We're gonna make that for you. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Some cool parts that we had. These are these are the mini guys, but it's interesting. They they'll always fail in the same way. So we'll we'll miniaturize a lot of this stuff and then do it on a big level. Um this one, um Carbon fiber composites, um, carbon tooling is always a pain in the butt. Um, this is still a little niche. Um, you gotta have a need to do a lot of customization and carbon fiber layout. Um, and then usually the people that do that are motorsports um, and other very, very high value kind of things where you just got loads and loads of money to, to throw around on this kind of thing. Um, but we've, we've got this cool new material. Um, so it's actually lost core. So we call it mandrel, um, but lost core tooling um, versus like eggshell. Um, essentially what you can do is you lay up around the tooling itself and then you heat it up to about 60 C. So just like a warm water bath, put it in there. And then um, I took the video, out, but you can see the shot of what he's doing, but he's essentially pulling it out. And the material you can print in SLA. So you can do any sort of like design you want, heat it up to 60 C and then yank it out. And it's essentially, it's like pulling crab meat out of the crop shell or, you know, it's like pulling crab leg. Um, so we've also used it. This one was for a really um, quadcopter, um, but kind of the same idea. That almost looks like a crab shell. Like, you know, pull it out of there basically, heat it up and just yank it out. Um, but, you know, fully functional from fiber layup in a matter of a day or two, rather than having to go mill your tooling and then, you know, do whatever that may be. Um, so that's the, the size of the part. Um, another place that it's just become the mode of operation is um, aerodynamics. Um, so also came from the motorsports business. Um, it's it's kind of fun, you know. There's a lot of overlap there in these industries where you have just unlimited capital. Um, you can do some really cool stuff. Um, essentially, all wind tunnel stuff is now started with printing. Um, you can get better um, light absorption based on the coloration, and then you can actually just mock up whatever you want to do. So most of these things are now in SLA, um, rather than having to carve wax and, or carve clay and do whatever you need to do there. Um, so investment casting in the early nineties, this was, it really, hearing aids was the first one that took off investment casting aligners. Um, but investment casting continues to be a big one. Um, Berkshire Hathaway bought a bunch of, there's PCC and a bunch of other casting houses. So the supply chain for casting is just crazy right now. Um, years to like 24 months is not crazy lead time for a titanium casting right now. Um, and part of that's the tooling, part of it's the actual pouring, but um, I only have this one on here just to show how old it is, but it used to go really, really slow, like the old SLAs, you can watch it dance around. Um, but um, there's kind of, when we look at the, the strengths of, you know, why would you cast it versus why wouldn't you just print it? Size is a big deal, um, the, the level of detail. Obviously, casting, you're not going to get quite the same level of detail. Um, 
but this is what it would look like. Um, so the this is the slurry this and then pour the metal in, and it's essentially the same kind of same kind of idea as lost wax, um, but you can do it at a, a much higher or a lower um, mass rate, um, and then you can really create through that structure what anisotropy or isotropy you want with it. So this is one of the new structures that we've been working on. The problem with this kind of thing is that you do get some level of anisotropy. So in like Z, it's really, really stiff because you kind of get where the nodes come together, you get the stiffness. So we came up with this like kind of asymmetrical diamond structure to slurry and cast. Um, you end up getting to a point where you get better isotropy um, in X, Y, and Z. So um, can't see what it looks like. Um, a lot of the space guys are doing this. Um, turbine blades that are cast, like high end castings, are, are doing this a lot. Um, we probably have 10, no, probably not 10,000, but like 7,000, 8,000 printers just doing castings. Um, this is the one that's coming into play, um, environmentally stabilized flame retardant stuff. Um, so you don't think about it, but all the like harnessing connectors and things like this, you know, T connectivity is one of the big guys that does connectors. Number one, Becton Dickinson, uh, medical device guys, and then uh, T connectivity, two largest injection molders in the world. And all they're doing is just these like harnesses and connectors. Um, so there's a lot of, but they also have hundreds of thousands of part numbers. So there's a significant desire to not necessarily have to keep inventory and tooling for all that stuff. Um, so you can print directly in SLA, or in this case, it's DLP, um, the harnesses. A lot of these, you know, you have to go through the same level of certification for the material. Um, so all the UL stuff in front of this with that. Um, connectors, just like the wiring harnesses that you connect. There's hundreds of these in every car that's driven. Um, you can create these, you know, they're, they're very, very cost sensitive because it's, it's a sunk cost essentially. Um, but yeah, we're creating these for like 35 cents a pop. Um, Multi-jet printing, which is um, polyjet, Stratasys calls it, but jet here, jet here, jet here. Um, we're starting to see more of this. So like direct dentures where you can do multi-material stuff. You can do like a hard material and a soft material of a different color. Um, this is actually assembled. Um, but you can you can directly do this um, with one one print as well. Mm -hmm. So the the dental business anatomical models has been has been big on this. Um, I think that's all I got.